When a strength coach puts together a strength training program to support an athlete or a group of athletes to achieve a particular athletic goal, they tend to use some sort of periodization. However, whether this periodization actually helps the athletes achieve better results than they would do without the periodization is not clear. In fact, the very use of periodization goes against the concept of specificity, which states that we should try and match the type of strength training to the type of athletic performance as closely as possible all of the time. Before I go much further talking about periodization and whether it's useful for athletes, I think it's important to spend a little bit of time explaining what periodization actually is and what it isn't. And indeed, one of the big problems that we run into when talking about periodization is that there is no single universally agreed definition that we can all sign up to. And that means that we tend to find one of three different types of definition, depending on who we're talking to or what book we're reading. And these types of definition are normative, which is where somebody says, this is what periodization is, and these are the features that it's supposed to have. And other people may disagree with those features and they may, may disagree with the definition. Uh, but a normative definition is where you put forward a, an idea and you defend why you think that's right. Uh, a teleological definition is where you um, say this is what periodization is supposed to do. So you might say periodization is supposed to um, reduce injury risk and improve performance. And a descriptive definition is where you look at all the common periodization uh, models and programs, and you try and find the common ground between them, and you say, these are the features of periodization programs, periodized programs, um, and these are the features of non-periodized programs. And by looking at the differences between the two, we can say, this is a definition of periodization in terms of what um, periodization tends to be uh, when it is used uh, by strength coaches in real life. So we have these three different types of definitions. The normative definition where you set out a, a way of periodization that you think is right. Um, and there's the teleological definition where you set out what you think periodization is supposed to do. And then there's the descriptive definition where we, we look at the literature, we look at what people are doing in the real world and we try and say, this is what we think people mean when they say periodization. Within the category of normative definitions of periodization, there can be a very wide range of possibilities. We can have very simple definitions and we can have very complex definitions. And the definitions really depend on the individual and often how they feel on the day. Now, we often see a lot of um, disagreements online about periodization, and what it's uh, supposed to do and uh, whether it's useful and how it should be used. And often those disagreements come back to differences between the individuals who are arguing about what periodization actually is. And that's because they each have their own normative definitions that they're applying to the term periodization. And that leads them to have different opinions about what periodization is doing and how it should be used and whether it's useful. Two very common, simple normative definitions of periodization are that periodization is just planning and that periodization is just variety. And these are normative definitions, they're not consensus views, they're not, uh, they haven't been written up as position statements anywhere. So we know that the individuals who are putting forward those ideas are setting out what they believe periodization actually is uh, and they're expecting us to either sort of disagree with them or agree with them uh, as appropriate. And we can see straight away that periodization is not just planning because we can have a non-periodized planned training program. So I can plan a training program with no periodization in it. And, and therefore, really, that normative definition falls over straight away. And similarly, I can have a, um, a varied training program with no periodization in it. So I can have a non-periodized varied training program simply by planning some variety in the form of either auto-regulation or giving the athlete some autonomy over what they they do in the workout, whether that's the order of the exercises or the exercises themselves or the rep ranges, it doesn't really matter, but I can incorporate um, non-periodized variety. 
So we have to be very careful with normative definitions because often the people who are putting forward those normative definitions haven't really thought them through and they don't really fit with the rest of the periodization literature or the way that periodization is being used by a lot of other people. If we want to find a descriptive definition of periodization, then we need to look at the periodized strength training programs that have been written by strength coaches and researchers and compare them with the non-periodized training programs that have been written by strength coaches and researchers. And it's quite important that we don't read the normative definitions and discussions that have been uh, written by those researchers in their um, studies and by the strength coaches in their books because those aren't relevant to the actual training programs that they ended up with. And what we're interested in is how uh, periodization is actually used when it is applied to a strength training program. So we look at the features that differentiate the periodized strength training program from the non-periodized strength training program. Um, and that gives us our descriptive definition. If we look at the strength training programs written by researchers and strength coaches, then we tend to find that periodized training programs have um, applied variety in three very specific ways. And those specific ways are that the variety is non-random, that it's pre-planned, and that it's timetabled. And wherever variety is applied in those three ways, then we would tend to call that a periodized training program. So if variety is applied in a random way, then we would not call that periodization. So people who go in the gym and literally do whatever they feel like on the day um, would definitely be displaying quite a lot of variety in their workouts and their training programs, but we wouldn't call that periodization. We'd call that a fairly random, instinctive way of training. And so straight away we can see why it's important to have non-random as part of our definition of the way in which variety is applied to a strength training program in order for it to be called a periodized training program. A central feature of periodization is that the type of variety that we apply is pre-planned. So classical periodization models like block and linear periodization tend to have very high volumes of moderate loads at the beginning of a training cycle and low volumes of either heavy loads or light loads and fast bar speeds at the end of a training cycle, depending on whether we're aiming to develop maximum strength or high velocity strength. Now, in contrast, autoregulation can be used to set volume for a workout um, on the day. So we can use a readiness test at the beginning of a workout to determine whether or not we're going to do a, a large number of sets or a moderate number of sets or a small number of sets. And this type of um, modulating volume, depending on a readiness test performed in a given workout, is not periodization. Uh, because it's not pre-planned, it's, it's an auto-regulatory way of training which takes the control away from the, the programmer at the beginning of the training program and puts it back um, into the hands of the athlete uh, or the, the coach um, on the day in which the athlete is training and it shifts the focus from being a, a planning focus to being a reactive focus um, on the conditions in which the athlete is working at any given point in time. Similar to planning the content of workouts in advance, periodization routines also apply variety in such a way that they timetable those workouts in advance. So in periodization routines, we specify how many workouts are done with a given load or a given volume before we switch to the next block or the next type of workout. Um, in some bodybuilding routines, we continue with a given rep range until we um, can no longer progress with that rep range. And at the point when we can no longer progress, then that triggers the decision to change the routine in some particular way. And that's not periodization because it doesn't involve a timetable switch from one type of training to another. The timetabling of the variety is inherent to the whole concept of periodization in the same way that the content of the workout is inherent and the non-random nature of the variety is inherent. So every one of these three features of variety is central to the concept of periodization. We can't have periodization without variety being applied 
in a non-random, pre-planned and timetabled way. At the beginning of this video, I stated that periodization has a problem to overcome, which is that it contradicts the principle of specificity. Now, the principle of specificity tells us that if we want to improve performance in a particular sporting movement, then we need to match the strength training program, the exercises and the types of loading, as closely as possible to the way in which force is produced in the sporting movement. So if the sporting movement requires um, high velocity hip extension to be performed, such as in sprinting and jumping, then we need to try and achieve the ability to produce high velocity force with the hip extensors through the strength training program. And if we're constantly changing our strength training program because periodization tells us to, then we're probably not focusing on developing that specific strength quality as much as we could do if we kept a non-periodized approach to that particular characteristic within the strength training program. In other words, if we did jump squats the whole time, we might get better results than if we constantly change in between high volume uh, moderate load squats and maximum strength squats and high velocity jump squats. Our descriptive definition of periodization also shows us that we have an additional problem when applying periodization in practice with athletes and that is that the pre-planning and timetabling of the workouts don't take into account the athlete's individual circumstances. So the athlete can potentially go through a block and not progress and may even go backwards and yet we've still programmed additional blocks that build on that first block as if they had progressed and similarly an athlete may get halfway through a particular training block and have a life event which causes them to become very stressed and yet we are expecting them to come into the gym and perform exactly the workouts that have been pre-planned and timetabled and that may not be appropriate and so some strength coaches and researchers have started to employ techniques to incorporate some auto-regulatory features um, into periodized routines. But essentially what we're doing is we're, we're stepping away from what periodization actually is and towards a non-periodized model that incorporates variety in other ways. We're just modifying it from the opposite end of the spectrum. If periodization has such big problems, why do people claim that the research shows that it works? Well, what the research shows is that load periodization has an effect on the performance that we can achieve in a strength test at the end of a training program. So load periodization is where we change the rep range that we use uh, during the program. So linear training programs that incorporate load periodization will have a, a light load in the first few weeks of a training program, a moderate load in the middle few weeks and a heavy load at the end. And they tend to show that um, compared with a moderate load throughout, um, the linear training program will achieve greater gains in maximum strength uh, at the end of the training program compared with the, the non-periodized routine. Um, similarly, a reverse linear program which starts with heavy loads, progresses to moderate loads and ends up using light loads will achieve greater gains in repetition strength, so muscular endurance at the end of a, a training program compared with a, um, a moderate load that's used for the whole period. And really all we're, we're looking at there is, is specificity. So the final few weeks before the strength test, the linear periodized uh, training program is using heavy loads and the non-periodized group is using moderate loads. Well, that's not really surprising that they're gonna get greater gains in maximum strength. And similarly, the reverse linear uh, group are performing light loads right before the muscular endurance test while the moderate group are performing moderate loads. And again, that's why they achieve greater gains in repetition strength. It's not really um, very difficult to understand why we see these results. And we don't really have much better research that shows us anything else. So we're trying to make these huge extrapolations based on load periodization research, which can be explained by the principle of specificity. So to me, it doesn't really make a lot of sense. And I'd rather apply the principle of specificity to a strength training program than periodization. 